The moment is finally here. Oh yeah, baby, 250R. <gasps> Hey, what's going on guys? Real quick before I start the video, I gotta ask a favor of you. Please give me a thumbs up if you're enjoying the content I'm making. Right now the ATV industry is struggling. You guys know me, I love side-by-sides and dirt bikes. I am not biased, but right now the ATVs are struggling. So let's do everything we can to bring them back, man. This is the ATV revolution and I need you guys in my army. So do me a favor, keep giving me that thumbs up and leave your comment section or leave the comments in the comment section below. I love all you guys, enjoy this video, peace out. What's going on guys? Welcome back to Project 250R. Today is finally the day. We're gonna tear down this 250R motor and see what's inside. For those of you that are unfamiliar, this thing is a 1987. So it's over 30 years old. I don't know if it was neglected or not. Most of this quad was in pretty decent shape, but a lot of stuff was left factory. So I don't even know what kind of bore we got going on in here. So we're gonna find out today. The breakdown of the motor is probably, I would say amongst the easier parts of a build. And generally I don't really need a manual, but I do have my climber service manual. Uh, for breakdowns, I don't usually go by the manual. If something's coming apart a little weird, then I will refer to the manual. And um, this is my first 250R motor. So I've done plenty of two strokes before, but I've never actually done a 250R. So it's possible that I'll stop and refer to the manual. And I'm gonna give you guys as many close-ups as I possibly can while keeping the, vi the video interesting. And uh, hopefully this will be a nice guide if you have to break down a 250R motor also. So regardless of whether or not you need a manual to break down your motor, there are some important things. One of my best friends today is gonna to be this little impact gun. Not all impacts are created equal. I have no affiliation with Milwaukee. However, I do recommend this impact gun. Um, they're fairly expensive. If you guys wanna check it out, I do have a link in my description below. Um, this is the M12, it's like their light duty, but I'll tell you what, this thing packs a punch. And what's nice about it is it's got some adjustment settings so that if you're going to be tightening things, you're less likely to strip things out because that is a huge issue with impact guns. And if you're not handy with one of these, I actually don't recommend using one because you can destroy pieces. Definitely grab an impact gun if you're gonna be breaking down a motor. It's gonna save you a lot of time and it's well worth the investment. Another thing that's really important is gonna be keeping everything organized, especially if you don't have a service manual. So it's gonna make your life a lot easier if in the breakdown process, you keep things separated, um, keep bolts and baggies or together with certain pieces because when you're putting everything back together, it's gonna be like a puzzle and it could be a nightmare if you put things back together the wrong way, you're gonna tank your motor and it's just bad. So I have a whole bench cleared off. I'm gonna use that to keep my parts nice and straight today. And then when we're done, we'll probably be cleaning everything up and we'll get uh, the cases sent out to uh, DBC Racing for vapor blasting. And then we have our ESR setup that's gonna go on top, our stroker crankshaft. This thing's gonna be the um, one of the first ever CEO 310 power valve motors. Um, at least to the best of my knowledge. So I can't wait to get this thing built. And I got some exciting news for you guys on the exhaust. I'm gonna save that for the end of the video. So definitely stick around to hear what's going on with that. All right, I think I've done enough talking. Let's get it. let's tear into it we might as well get started with the spark plug now keep in mind guys I have never done any work on this specific motor I bought the quad a couple months ago and as far as I know it is basically stock at least everything else on the quad was so we're gonna find out the plug really doesn't look too bad it's a little sooty I think it was a little rich it's not as bad as I thought it would be. Quad ran pretty good. Got my cobalt impact here for stuff that's a little bit tighter. should not be this tight. It's 
it's pretty common that these heads get stuck on here, especially if it hasn't been built in a long time. Uh, definitely don't want to use a solid hammer though. Even if you don't damage anything internal, you're going to nick up uh, the outside. So I have a soft dead blow right here. You can also use a block of wood and a regular hammer. Usually just a few taps will break it loose and it'll come right off. It actually looks really good. I don't have the kicker on there or I'd roll the piston down. We're going to be pulling the cylinder off anyway though, so we'll get a good look in there. But the top of the piston looks good and uh, it appears to be in really good shape. Pulling off these radiator hoses, a lot of times they're kind of stuck on there. The best way that I've found is to just get regular pliers and don't squeeze too tight. But you do that and it kind of breaks whatever's keeping it stuck on there. And then it'll pull off a lot easier. All right, let's get these Boyson reeds off. And it is recommended that you take, in, in a system like this, like either with a head or any kind of thing where there's multiple bolts, it's usually recommended in the manual that you take things off just like you would put them on, kind of in a crisscross pattern. And it prevents you from warping things. Nice reed block. Give you guys a look at the intake port. And like I said, I've never dealt with a 250R before, but I do believe that this is stock. It doesn't look like there's any porting done in there. Everything looks good though. It's kind of neat to be able to see through. You can see the cylinder walls in there and the crank rod. Pretty cool. All right, let's get the cylinder off. You can see right here this coolant drain bolt. This is actually to encourage airflow when you're draining the system. Now, according to the manual, if the cylinder is being stubborn, it's okay to gently pry. So I have this wide crowbar and it's a nice flat portion of the case right here that should be strong. You gotta be really careful when you're doing this and take note of what you're prying against so you don't mess anything up. I think if I can get a good side on the underside of this coolant outlet, I might be able to break it free. Shouldn't cause any damage. And then I can probably give it a nice tap on the other side where the exhaust flange is. And if I, if I am to damage the exhaust flange, that's not really a big deal because um, that can be replaced. I tend to get a little bit more encouragement with a sledge and a board. Um, now keep in mind, this motor is not bolted down. So a lot of the force is being transferred, uh, making the motor rock back and forth. So a lot of that is why uh, the cylinder is not just breaking loose right away. But this is a nice angle right here. And it shouldn't damage anything. Guess we'll find out. We got it. Wow, that was a major pain in the ass to get off. I think these dowels were probably what was holding us up. 
The cylinder looks good though, and we managed to get away without any damage at all. We probably could have got this thing off a lot easier. It took me like 30 minutes um, if I really smash it hard, but that's the result um, having no damage when you take your time. I just had to keep going back and forth and back and forth and eventually it did break free. But man, what a pain in the ass. Give you guys a look in there. It really, it looks good. This could probably be honed and you put a new piston in there. There's no uh, scoring or gouges or anything. The ports look good. And uh, we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison with that ESR cylinder too. But we're not gonna do that until the end of the video. So for now, let's just keep moving. This piston's in decent shape. You can see it's got some wear right here. You can actually see it. You can, uh, you can actually feel the wear, <clears throat> but it's not horrible. And I'm not sure who makes the piston. I'll plug these part numbers in on the top and we'll see if maybe we can see if this is an aftermarket piston or if it's an OEM Honda piston, I'm not sure. Damn, someone really spread it on when they RTV'd this Honda stator cover. Look at that. It's really stuck on there good too. We'll get it off. Ooh, look at this. Oh, that's snapped. Look at that. Now we'll use this flywheel puller to get the flywheel off. This is actually the same puller I used on the Banshee. Uh, the same one will should work on the 250R. And it's a little bit cruddy in there. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of oil in there to kind of help out so we can thread this thing in. You definitely wanna make sure that you got a good amount of thread started because if you don't, you uh, risk ripping them out and then you're in trouble. And it is reverse threaded. So then we'll take this and thread it in by hand. Now we're gonna hold this with a seven eighths inch wrench and we're actually gonna drive this pin inwards and that should pull the flywheel right off. We are gonna use an impact gun for this. Oops. There it is. Now I'm going to take the stator off. We are going to be running an HPI ignition, so we're not going to use this. Now this has the counterbalancer behind it, so I'm going to wait until uh, we take the clutch cover off and we'll see what's on the other side before I go pulling these bolts out and sliding things out of place. Our water pump cover. Same thing here, we've got little pry points. And I couldn't find one on the other half, but we can hit behind here. Shouldn't have any problems. So I may utilize those in popping this thing off if it's as tight as everything else has been.
Give you guys a look in here behind that cover. Came off fairly easy. Definitely gotta be careful if you're doing any kind of prying, um, but it was pretty easy to get off. Everything looks pretty good in here. You can see the fingers on the clutch are a little bit worn. I'm sure once we get these uh, clutch fibers and discs out, we'll notice. You can kind of see they're grooved, which is really common, but it's okay. We're gonna be putting a Henson uh, billet basket in there. So we'll go ahead and take the clutch off now. You gotta be really careful with the clutch. It's gonna go real easy with this impact gun. Now, if you have a clutch tool, you'll be able to hold the entire assembly. You don't actually have to keep these plates in here. The way I like to do it though, is by holding the plates kind of with a rag, you squeeze everything together and um, hit this nut with the impact and it usually breaks it free really easy. So the first thing we have to do though, is um, flatten out these safety tangs. They, are, they hold that nut from uh, backing off with vibration. So we got the 27 mil on the impact gun. Just take a rag, hold this like so. It comes right off. This clutch is actually in pretty good shape. It's really not too bad. So I'm gonna take this clutch off as a whole just to keep everything nice and neat. Got the idler gear back here, two needle bearings and this sleeve, we'll pull the kicker out. Now we gotta take off this primary drive gear and here's our counterbalancer. So you guys may have heard of the penny trick where you wedge a penny in between the, gear, the teeth of the gears and that prevents this from spinning and that'll let us break this uh, bolt free. I um, Essentially, I'm gonna do the same thing. This is a soft aluminum washer, or um, nail rather, and I just kind of put it in the teeth like that. And that'll usually do the trick for me. And because it's soft, it won't damage anything in here. Now we'll get this counterbalancer out of here. There's this retaining piece. And according to the manual, this hole in the counterbalancer needs to be in the nine o'clock position to line up with the, um, the crankshaft to be removed. <clears throat> I don't know if that depends, I imagine, on the uh, position of the crank. All right, now we're gonna take apart this shift assembly here. If you don't have a manual, I would definitely recommend taking pictures because this can get kind of tricky. Uh, but once you've done it a couple times, it's actually pretty simple. So the first thing we're gonna do, this is the shift fork right here. If this goes through the bottom of the cases and the shifter is actually hooked up to the other side. So we're just gonna pull that through. Obviously, if the shifter's on the other side, you have to remove it. Now we're gonna take this plate off. And here's where you really gotta be careful, is this assembly in here. There's little springs and pins inside here. And I got lucky that this didn't pop apart. And I'm gonna keep this together for now. But you gotta be really careful that you don't lose those pieces. Now we've got this little shift arm to take off. On the Banshee, it's called the shift detent arm. And then we're gonna take this piece off right here, which is attached to the shift drum. In the manual, it's actually referred to the shift drum shifter. So we'll roll it to a stopping point. Now the 250R shifts smoothly as it is, so we don't have to do any mods here. But if you're a Banshee guy and you're having trouble shifting, 
definitely check out my video on the Shift Star mod and the Shift Detent mod. All right, now I'll flip this around and finish off that counter counterbalancer. I'm gonna be nice and gentle with these because there was that, this bolt here was snapped. Now, according to the manual, you're supposed to use a drift and actually punch out this, it's called a bearing holder for the, um, the counterbalancer. So I'm gonna go around the other side and we'll try to punch it through. Uh, we'll see if we can get it just leaving the case like this so you can actually watch it come out. That is the bearing holder for the counterbalancer. All right, now we're gonna split the cases, but before we do that, we have, I believe there's 10 bolts on um, the left-hand side behind like where the stator is and everything, and back here. So we're gonna pop those out, and then we'll get to splitting the cases. Now, according to the service manual, if you hang on to the right side case and tap the crankshaft and the transmission shaft, that's supposed to actually split the cases. Now, if it doesn't, we can use a crankcase puller. And I don't have much faith in this method, especially because I do see some RTV in the case seam and everything else has just been so tight. But who knows, maybe we'll get lucky. So we'll use the dead blow and we'll see if we can crack this thing loose. It's actually working. And I imagine this gasket would just rip, but just in case this is causing some resistance, I'm gonna cut the gasket right in the seam. Well, that came apart a lot easier than I expected. So we're gonna go ahead and pull the transmission out. Um, the crank is loose already, so that should just pop right out, but it's kind of propping up the engine nicely so you guys can see in here. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna do is take, um, we wanna get these shift forks out of the way. So you can see actually in the other side of the case, this one pin came out, um, but typically I think it would probably stick in that side of the case. So you have to remove the pin, we'll remove the one for the other um, shift forks just pops right out and then you swing the shift forks out of the way and remove them and I'm not sure if we'll be able to get this one out we got it um, I don't think we can get this upper fork out until we remove the drum so we'll see if we can pull the drum out all right there's a pin up here too you don't want to lose the pin and this transmission should just pull right out. Um, I don't plan to do anything with the transmission. And it was shifting really nicely when I pulled everything apart. So I will inspect it once I get it out of here. But I don't think we're going to have to service this or anything. So I plan to kind of keep it together. So it appears this collar on the other end of the transmission is actually seized to this shaft. So I thought maybe it was a grooved collar and it had to be spun into the correct orientation to get it off, but I don't think that's the case. I don't see anything in the service manual. So I think it's just a case of having really bad dirt buildup and maybe some rust in there. So I'm gonna take a little PB blaster and shoot it in there. And I'll take a break, let that soak in and hopefully it just pops out. All right, well that PB blaster's soaking in there. I figure I'll give you guys the comparison of the OEM cylinder versus the ESR. And right off the bat, I'm sure you guys can notice the, the overall profile 
of the ESR is just bigger. Granted, it is bigger. You know, this is a, um, one is a 310 and the other one is the factory bore. I did measure the piston and the bore at 66 millimeters, which I believe is the OEM bore. So this is either a freshened up cylinder, maybe it had a new sleeve, or it just has that low of hours. I'm really not sure, um, but you guys can look in there. It's in pretty good shape. It's a little shiny, but I think you could hone that and this would be perfectly fine. There's no cracks in any of the bridges or anything. It looks good to me. If we look at the ESR, you can see how much more aggressive that intake port is as opposed to the OEM. I mean, the ports are just aggressive all the way around. You can see there are actually, there are three exhaust ports there, and I think there's four on the OEM, but that's just because that middle one is has a bridge in the middle. I'm not really sure why they have that. A little bit of a different design. You can see there's port windows all over this thing. Same thing on the OEM though. They're just in different locations, a little bit different orientation, and um, the size is obviously different. So as you can imagine, the ESR cylinder most likely has much better flow. I'll tilt this on its side and you guys can see the ports down here. Not too much difference down here. It looks like the OEM setup has a good amount of flow too. And I imagine the water jacket um, holds more volume on the ESR to keep it a little bit cooler. And of course, you have the power valve up here, whereas the OEM style does not have a power valve. But yeah, you can really see it right there how much bigger the ESR is. All right, well that counter shaft is being extremely stubborn and I don't want to smash it too hard. So I'm going to let the oil do the work. And in the meantime, I'm going to pry out our crankshaft bearing uh, I'll pry out the seal and then we're going to throw this, well, clean it up so it doesn't stink like shit. And then I'm going to throw it in the oven, heat it up to 212 degrees, and then that should make tapping out the bearing a lot easier. All right, so it came out pretty clean. Just hit it with some uh, brake clean. Didn't do anything crazy, but I really wanted to get the oil off because that's what's going to make the oven really stink. So I have the oven heated up to 225 degrees and uh, we'll go ahead, get this thing nice and hot and this bearing should tap right out. Oh yeah. Some crispy fried 250R. So we'll go ahead and punch that bearing out. Well, they definitely come out easier when this thing is put in the oven. If you guys remember uh, when I did the Raptor and I put the crank bearings in after putting it in the oven, they actually dropped into place. And we're gonna throw our frozen bearing in there. Holy shit. So I don't know if you saw, but that one bearing actually just pushed right through, which is awesome. Um, I'm not gonna lie, that was kind of spur of the moment. I wasn't actually planning on taking all of the bearings out. And um, I talked to uh, Blake while uh, this was in the oven. And uh, to get these vapor blasted, they all have to be removed. So <laughs> kind of just hastily took care of it while this thing was still hot and uh, it worked. So let's see if we can get that counter shaft out. All right, so let's see what happens here. Uh, this has been sitting for, I don't know, an hour and a half. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a block of wood on top of here and I'm gonna use this sledge. I already know you guys are gonna hammer, hammer me, so just, uh, hit me in the comments below, but I'm gonna basically just let the weight of the hammer come down. I'm gonna try anyways, and hopefully I don't have to put too much force into this, and we'll see if we can break that loose.
Wow. All right, I think it's a good idea to stop whaling on this thing, and we'll let that PB blaster do some work tonight, and hopefully this thing will break free in the morning. I'm sure some of you guys are going to hammer me for using a hammer on this thing, especially directly, um, but I have this thing set up pretty safely. It's on blocks of wood, and um, this is a pretty beefy counter shaft. I don't think I did any damage there, um, and the fact that the weight of this hammer directly hitting this isn't breaking it free definitely tells me that um, either the the inner race of the bearing or this collar or both are rusted to the counter shaft or you know the grit and dirt from years and years has just built up in there uh, it's very possible that that's what's going on so hopefully pb blaster is usually pretty good at breaking stuff down like that and um hopefully in the morning i'll be able to battle this thing and uh, we'll win that one so i'll give you guys an update on that in another video um, as for now though i'm just gonna get out the rest of these bearings i'm sure i'll be able to get that counter shaft out tomorrow morning i got my work cut out for me we have all the parts laid out everything needs to be cleaned off these cases are going to be sent to dbc racing for vapor blasting and they will be coming back looking like brand new and as i'm standing here i'm noticing i never pulled out this clutch actuator but that's easy enough to do it literally just pulls right out so as i said before guys i do have some exciting news about the exhaust um, so basically what wound up happening, um, as you guys know, Eddie Sanders is pretty backed up and I wasn't sure if he was going to have that TRX-5 pipe um, ready for this build. So just in the instance that he wasn't able to get it done in time, I called up Arlen from LED Performance and he's actually in the works of developing a pipe specifically for the 310 power valve. And um, between the two of us, we're going to work together and see if we can get something developed. Uh, I might be doing testing on that pipe. I'm not really sure exactly what's going to happen, uh, but I'm really excited to run that LED exhaust. And the really cool news is Eddie actually reached out to me right after I called Arlen and he got the pipe done. So I will have Eddie's uh, TRX-5 pipe tomorrow, actually today, uh, when this video is being posted. Um, it won't be in this video, unfortunately, because I'm filming on Thursday. Uh, but I'm really excited to run both exhausts. And what I plan to do is take them to the dyno. We'll be able to get a comparison, see how the two compare with each other. And one pipe is chrome. The other one is raw. If you don't know what raw means, I'll put up a, piss, a picture right here of an LED exhaust. Um, basically, it's just not coated. Uh, but I think that raw finish is going to look really sharp on this build. But it's going to be really cool to have both exhausts. And um, it's, the comparisons are what's really cool, you know. So it actually turned out really awesome. I'm super excited for it. I might have a picture up on my Instagram of the uh, TRX-5 exhaust. If you haven't already, make sure to give me a follow at Michael Sabo 350 I like to post up updates about what's going on in the shop, and I also like to post up some badass pictures of bikes that you guys send in. All right, guys, so that's going to be it for me. Remember to give me that thumbs up button and make sure to subscribe if you're interested in following the project. We're always doing projects like this in the shop. And until then, guys, I will see you in the next video. Have a good weekend. Peace out.